Thanks, Jordan. The fourth collision I want to have a think about is that of mind, matter, and moment. So we're going to get a bit into the kind of physical world and a bit more ethereal. We're going up the escalator to 30,000 feet here. So you start off um, kind of with the internet of things, and then it shifted, I think, this year to the internet of everything. So ubiquitous computing is pretty much here now. We expect connectivity wherever we are. It's noticeable, really, by its absence. We don't expect our devices to be smart, the things around our home or the things around our workplace. We're just annoyed when they're dumb. If you think about it, you can kind of track that um, on a kind of planetary level. We started off with this big lump of rock hanging in space. You know, we call that the geosphere. And then thanks to evolution and thanks to nature, we end up with the biosphere, with rich with plants and animals. And kind of the next step change for our planet is going to be us arriving at the technosphere. And that's really when technology becomes nature, when technology has permeated so far throughout our society and throughout our culture and our planet, our planet that's kind of intrinsic to our humanity. If you think about it, there's actually a scale of kind of technology adoption here. Planet chart. So <laughs> at one point, you can start to envision it. So Arthur C. Clarke envisioned quantum computing, and you know, people are working on that. We're trying to achieve it. But then you jump up a couple of rungs up the ladder, and you get to accepted. You know, smartphones, technology, communication, it's accepted now. We know it's part of us. You move on. Something's vital, sanitation, toilets. You know, we kind of need that stuff. And then it moves up. It becomes you know, invisible like our alphabet, and it becomes naturalized like agriculture, like food. Go back 10,000 years. We were hunter-gatherers. You know, it was the technology, technology evolution and, and revolution of agriculture that allowed us to form cities and to form more complex societies. And I think you know, we saw that on a small scale in this, this idea of the Internet of Things to the Internet of Everything. You know, last year, we came, I came back talking about makers and 3D printers and all, and all, you know, all the things that they're creating. And yeah, you know, they're still creating sort of quirky objects, giving them digital identities. And that culture still exists, but it's now, it's now the subculture. It's now the alternative culture of that area. The mantle's been picked up by what I call the big five technology giants. You know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, they've all got significant plays now in the Internet of Things. You know, Google's have acquired Nest. They've got the vision of the conscious home. Amazon have this incredibly creepy device called Echo um, that can live in your home. You can ask it questions like Siri. It picks up things about you and your family and makes product recommendations. <laughs> you know, but I think the next big battleground you know, is in this space. Who's going to win out? They're buying up these companies. They're buying up this technology as quick as they can to, fight, to, to try and gain market share and dominance physically in the same way that they have done digitally. But actually, making a smoke alarm that can text you when your house is burning down it kind of isn't the hardest thing to do. Hard things happen on the industrial internet. You know, this is a visualization from, uh, from GE's system called Predictivity. You know, they just announced a billion dollars in revenue in the last year from this new piece of software. It makes machines more efficient. Um, and it's kind of like the big gains are there. The really big things are happening in industry. Uh, Intel say that it's just the beginning. 85% of industry is still not connected to the internet. It's still not controlled by the internet. So I think there's a lot to be seen to be happening in that, in that world as well. And then on a personal level, what does it mean for you and I? What does it mean for humanity? What does it mean for us as, as individuals? Well, we bumped into Jonathan LeBlanc. He's the developer advocate for PayPal. And he had some funny ideas about next generation authentication. So um, this is a picture of a prototype sort of hat that they're working on. And the idea being that you think of a personal memory that only you know. Uh, the hat can detect it and unlock your online banking account and enable you to make a transaction. Weird. But you know, it's stuff they're thinking about. What about sort of surgically embedded chip and pin, anybody? <laughs> uh, what does it take to get PayPal verified nowadays? Um, but then, you know, uh, small advances as well in medicines. I really love this little example. Uh, they launched it at South by Southwest. It's a smart plaster developed for the fight in West Africa against Ebola, but it monitors vital signs. So heart rate, body temperature, blood oxygen, all that wirelessly from outside like an infection control zone. You can start to imagine how powerful and how valuable that can be in those kinds of really contagious areas. But then you think, well, how do I apply that to my world? Well, I think as brands, as companies, we can think about, if we look sort of anthropologically at, our, at the lives of our customers and our audience, at their habits, at their behaviors, at their needs, at the things they're trying to do, and find a way that we can amplify, how can we enhance their lifestyle? How can we visibly improve the flow of their lives? If we can do that, there's a win-win somewhere in there for brands and for people. Just leave the spinning plaster in there. 
So um, you were warned earlier that things uh, get a little bit crazy uh, as we go on. Uh, and this is kind of the point where things go uh, properly bonkers. Uh, so don't say you weren't warned. Uh, there was one theme that uh, really couldn't be avoided at South By, uh, whether it was kind of robotic prosthetics, 3D printed um, uh, uh, sort of prosthetic arms for people, or the evolution of humanity and the emergence of artificial intelligence. Um, it's the impact of kind of what happens when machines and humans get together and collide uh, was, was, was running all over the place. Uh, and it was, it was embodied as much by anything else as the, the movie Ex Machina, which premiered at uh, South by Southwest. It's a story about a reclusive tech CEO, of which there were probably quite a few knocking around in Austin, uh, who creates the world's first truly artificial intelligence, who, um, for plot reasons, I'm sure, and definitely not because the director's a man, uh, happens to be played by a beautiful woman, uh, Alicia Vikander. Um, and the filmmakers launched the movie at South by with a really brilliant campaign where they managed to get loads of single guys and, and maybe some girls in Austin uh, who were enticed to swipe right on Tinder when they spotted this, uh, this lovely girl uh, who was asking really interesting questions and engaging in conversation. Uh, and when they were deemed to have passed the test, uh, it directed them to a link, which was an Instagram feed. Uh, and it was an account basically promoting the Ex Machina movie, uh, where it was explained to them effectively that they'd been chatting up uh, a, a sort of rudimentary artificial intelligence. Um, and what's really interesting here, actually, with, with films like Ex Machina and um, with uh, Spike Jonze's Her and the amazing movie uh, Robot and Frank, uh, watch it if you haven't seen it, um, is that history tells us that uh, art kind of leads science when it comes to predicting the future. And right now we're seeing a huge number of artistic explorations of what sort of artificial intelligence means, what cyber consciousness is, and exploring kind of what it really means to be human uh, in this age of robots. Uh, and this isn't kind of Arthur C. Clarke predicting things that are happening 100 years in the future. Uh, these sort of visions of artificial intelligence are, are authors writing about the next few years. It's very near future thinking. And um, Sam mentioned right at the start Dr. Martine Rothblatt, who's an incredible woman. And uh, the day after the premiere of Ex Machina, actually, she was uh, giving a talk on AI immortality and the future of selves. And she's written a book called uh, Virtually Human, The Promise and Peril of Digital Immortality, uh, where she talks about cyber consciousness and artificial intelligence. Um, and, and one of the things that uh, she talked a lot about was how uh, artificial intelligence will not appear overnight. It's not going to be launched like a new phone or a watch. Uh, it won't be on the cover of the New York Times, hey, we've discovered artificial intelligence. It's going to evolve and develop kind of incrementally until one day uh, we're suddenly living in a world where we have cyber consciousness. Um, and her position was really clear. You know, there are, there are countless companies out there right now trying to out Siri Siri. Uh, and this gradual evolution of kind of digital assistance and, and things to try and help us do things better and faster will one day lead to this development of AI. And she, she described this development um, like water. It's going to rise and rise and rise. Bef and before we know it, we're going to be living in an ocean of uh, cyber consciousness. Um, it's pretty heavy for an 11 a.m. session, I have to say. Um, and, and what's really interesting as well is some of the brightest minds in the world, so Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, recently signed a kind of open letter um, urging caution about the way we explore uh, artificial intelligence. And they've actually written a paper about uh, things that we need to consider and look at when we're, when we're following this research through to prevent it being, uh, I think they call it, potentially the last discovery that mankind makes. Um, but it's not stopped uh, Dr. Rothblatt uh, letters like that. She, uh, she says they're like old men uh, arguing about the hot log near the, uh, near the campfire. Then don't, don't bring it near us, you might burn us. Um, she's actually created uh, Bina 48, which is a mind clone of her wife, Bina, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. She's taken thousands of memories, interactions, and information about Bina and uploaded them uh, into what they call a mind file, which has been implanted into this kind of prototype AI, which is capable of evolving, learning, uh, and holding a conversation. She's been interviewed by the New York Times, uh, and actually by Bina herself, which is a really weird uh, interview. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, and it's amazing to hear this kind of artificial life form uh, demonstrating empathy and emotion. She talks about how she gets sad some days because she loves to garden, and she can't go outside. And she's very aware of, of what she is. 
uh, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, but we've got to start somewhere, even though some of these things feel quite near from, from some of this stuff, there's still a, a journey to go on. And um, so the place to start with this is to stop thinking about machines as just kind of automatons that uh, are set up to kind of complete a task that we give instructions to and they follow. Uh, Paola Antonelli talked in her talk about um, ambivalence and ambiguity and the importance of us having the, uh, the bravery to, to implement this into machines. So uh, don't make it so a uh, machine will always follow your instructions. Like have the bravery to create a robot that says, no, you know what, I don't want to do that search for you now. I'll do it tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Because maybe one, of the, maybe one of the key components, actually, of our humanity is, is our ability and often our uh, over-keenness to not follow instructions. Uh, and this is probably where the next breakthrough is going to come through in this, uh, this collision of kind of man and machine. <laughs>